back at WNST, Taos and Baltimore, and Baltimore Positive. We are uh, positively into uh, the worry season, you know, the uh, the Monday morning blues, the, oh, well, actually Tuesday morning blues, and then the, the short week of how in the world are we going to beat Patrick Mahomes? Dennis Galatzos and I did not get together right in the aftermath, uh, much like John Harbaugh, who uh, had a press conference for three people that two didn't make it to, and I was one of them, uh, that lasted one minute and 52 seconds. Dennis, I, you and I didn't do radio on Tuesday. I flew home. I didn't keep you up all night. I, I could have done 1 a.m. or 2 a.m. or 3 a.m. radio because I was doing that fluke. <laughs> uh, for, and there's video evidence of me sitting in the press box. Doing that. Um, but I've given you a cooling off period. You know, you're you're doing your thing on Thursday this week. I'm going to do your show. There's this sort of quick turnaround. And then there's the reality of how beaten up they are, how they snatched defeat out of the jaws of victory and then almost lost it and gave it back. But they're 0 and 1, and this is a very, very difficult week for them. It really is, and I'm glad you gave me some space to get my my head right. I, I've got to tell you, midweek, and I and I'm still feeling the ill effects of the game. Usually, I can shake off losses much quicker, but this one has lingered longer than I would have thought, uh, Nestor. Because you look at the game, there's half a dozen, eight, ten, ten plays maybe you wish you could have back, right? And and things that really had an impact on the outcome of the game, whether it was physical errors by the players, alignments, uh, assignments, uh, the coaching, uh, the coaching calls. I mean, there was a lot of stuff there to unpack and I'm not sure that I've done unpacking it yet at this point of the week. Well, well, let's, let's begin at the beginning, as we would say. Um, And, and again, I don't even, this isn't for me on John or Eric, really. I mean, th- these are injuries where Eric signed three running backs in five hours last Thursday, right? So, y- y- you know, and, and incredible guys, guys that six weeks from now may run for 100 yards, and I completely, I can I can see Le'Veon Bell doing that. I can see, like, there's only one ball, but I can see this being a formidable offense in week 10. Now, what happens between now and then, and what happens to this offensive line? And now Tyree Phillips, you lose another guy. You've lost Marcus. Pitch. When Humphrey was out there, Gimpy coming up, I'm oh, like, I saw your on. tweet. You tweeted that right away. And, and I saw it. And we all uh, held our collective breath in Esther. That was a look when, when Peters went down, not that the other injuries were great, but I thought, man, this is a devastating injury. You're talking about a, a, a Hall of Fame caliber player, what he brings to that back end. And it, it showed up early and often uh, as, as Derek Carr, particularly later in the game, just, just picked the Ravens apart. Huge loss uh, with Peters. Well, I, I think offensively for the O-line and for what they're trying to do, right? Like, we all just take it for granted they run the ball. Ah, they run the ball, they run the ball. They need to pass the ball. That's what they don't do well. They got to pass. They got to sign new linemen. They've got to use draft picks on wide receivers. They got to sign other failed wide receivers into other places and bring Sammy Watkins in and, and, you know, bring in his his caliber of a a lottery pick kind of guy and, and keep him healthy and all that. And then there's what we saw, what really made it to the field Monday, Den. So for all of the bluster of you on Thursday and me on Sunday and us on Monday and us in January, and we need to sign players and we need to get the best wide. We need to do all of these things. You and I checked off on everything, basically everything, right? Like they're really good at doing this. This isn't about me kissing Eric's ass or John. They've been doing this a long time. They're top of class, but they are not ready in the same way your dealership wouldn't be ready if you started losing 20% of your talent. You know what I mean? And you have to replace them with people on the street. And I think this goes for any business or industry. I lowered my expectation. You know, I got on the plane and I went out there, no Dobbins. But the things that that were sold like Villanueva is going to play well and that Zeitler's not 30 something and that Ronnie Stanley's going to be okay over there and that we're going to give Andrews money and he's going to play like a top five tight end, even though he's a top 10 tight end kind of sort of Um, we've seen two already this week, last week in Waller this week in, in Kelsey that, you know, so just for the offense, they want to pass the ball, but we've almost forgotten like how good at running they are when they run. And at whatever point that is, they pull the pin out and decide to start throwing the football. That's usually right around the time things go wrong. Well, you know what? I think they have a legitimate shot at beating the Chiefs this week. Uh, the, the crowd noise was immense. You were there. 
I knew it would be an issue for the offensive line, particularly the tackles. They can hear the calls, right? They can hear the audibles. I think you'll see them play much, much better in the friendly confines at MNT Bank Stadium Sunday night. And I, I do think the Kansas City Chiefs, in contrast with their revamped offensive line, they're going to struggle. They struggled at home, of course, against Jadavian Clowney and uh, the other end, uh, whose name escapes me at this time, uh, <laughs> for, okay. the, for, the, for the Browns. But anyway, you got two all pros on the edges. And I think that Orlando Brown Jr. and whoever the other tackle is for the Chiefs is going to struggle for the same reasons that Villanueva and Stanley struggled. In addition to Villanueva playing a different position, right, uh, right tackle versus left tackle. And Ronnie Stanley coming back from a very significant injury. But I do expect the offensive line to bounce back in a big way against the Kansas City Chiefs. Dennis Colazos is here. I will be on his show. He is the uh, Sunday Sports Voice and the D. Colazzo Show out on Twitter. You can find him from 3 until 5 on Thursday with a mixed bag of guests. And, of course, on Sunday, usually getting you ready for a 1 o'clock kick. We have all day. we got Sunday night football this week. You mentioned how loud it was. You know, I didn't feel that in the stadium. You know, I, okay. it didn't feel like a louder place to me. I even tweeted at one point after there was a jump on the field. With, uh, it wasn't Bozeman. Who, so one of our guys jumped. Uh, who was it? I it mean, was it was early on. I forget. It was who very early it. in the game. So yeah. It was, might have been Tyler. Maybe. I don't know. It doesn't even matter. But I said, it doesn't feel that loud to me in here. Now, at the end, oh. when the game got nut cut in the end, in the fourth quarter, last eight minutes, it was delirium in there. But it really wasn't like that in the beginning. Then, a lot of empty seats. A lot of empty seats. Really? Well, a lot Kevin... of wine and cheese. And, and, and hear me out on this, because I, I talked to my, my, uh, my friends out in Vegas who are connected to the team, to the Raiders themselves, that the Raiders have a massive fan base of – uh, all sorts of Hispanic folks that are legal, not legal, vaccinated, not vaccinated, that would always go to the black hole. The vaccination, vaccination issue for the game changed the fans that could get into the game. 30, 40 percent of the fan base that would be P1. I'll spend 300, 400 bucks on a ticket. I mean, I'm talking I was in. How about this? You, you did give you a little Raider fan base. Uh, I had an hour and a half in the Albuquerque airport. You ever been to New Mexico? <laughs> Never have. Did you see the internet debate between me and my wife that became a very, very heavy thread on Facebook? You did I see did. this? Yeah, I did. So if you pee, flush the toilet in the airport, or maybe even the number two, and that would really memorialize it. But I'm thinking if you order beer in a nachos in the airport and you have a receipt that says you spent $21 in Albuquerque and you peed and you went to the bathroom and I said to my wife, I held the video up. I'm like, where are we? She said, I'm in Albuquerque, New Mexico. How can you say you've never been to New Mexico now that you've been here, right? <laughs> so I'm in Albuquerque and we went into the bar and we got a big, tall Modelo, you know, it was on sale. And I looked over and it was all Raiders fans coming in, getting on the plane because it was an Albuquerque, Vegas puddle jumper that we were on on Sunday night. Games on in uh, in the bar. And it, the, the last game's in the third quarter. So it was the Rams game was on. And we're watching it a little bit. And I saw all the Raiders fans come in. And, my, and we're the only Ravens fans, you know, in Albuquerque for an hour, right, on this plane. There were two other people that were on the plane that were Ravens fans that went through. And the guys came in, pipe fitters, welders, union, electric, deck to the nine and all, like, all of their gear. And, they, and I started talking to them. And they didn't know each other, but they did in a minute. Ray! You know, they, they, they start the chance and they're, this is in the Albuquerque airport the night before the game. So I'm talking to all of them. Yeah, you, you know, it's, it's amazing. The passion and these kids, they, there aren't people in airports in Spartanburg flying the Ravens games every week, every airport on the West coast. These guys have been doing this going to Oakland. God, we go to San Diego, man. Every year, you know, when they play, so they, they've been doing this for years and years. Plopping the team down in Vegas, the issue is vaccination right. and who can come and who couldn't come. It was a very tame crowd. My wife bought a $205 ticket. Thanks, Chad Steele. Uh, and, and $20 beers. The beers were $18, but when you tip, it's $20, right? So $20, she bought two $20 beers and a $205 ticket. Her seat was in the last row in the corner, uh, you know, up, up in the corner. And I was worried about her. She got mm -hmm. a ticket on Wednesday and I'm like, I wouldn't have her running around the upper deck of the black hole. Never. 
Like I've, I've done that. I sat out there with Ray Bachman for an AFC championship game. Um, you know, I, um, uh, I, I, when they won, literally I was in Oakland the, the day they won the AFC championship game, uh, 20 years ago, uh, headed to the Super Bowl that week. So I, I saw that fan base. I would never, this, I, I heard a bad stuff. A guy in the airport said they dumped a bunch of mustard on me after we lost. And I'm like, Okay, you, you know, but it was this sparkling new right. dome, right? I mean, everybody's sort of on their best behavior. I walked with a Raven shirt for two and a half hours. My wife wore, a, you know, had some purple on. Uh, I had a Raven's mask when I was in the mask area where people were a little. Didn't I didn't have, have anybody say, like, literally, nobody, huh? not one, hey, buddy, going to be a long day. Nothing even respectfully competitive. It was almost like a Super Bowl. Like it was really calm and quiet. I, it again. So I, crowd, I don't though. think different the noise crowd. was there. It was different, a different crowd. Totally different, different crowd. Look, I, I, the, the first time I noticed how, how passionate the Raiders fan base was, was on Twitter. I was watching the Jets and, and the Raiders on TV and Sam Darnold may have been a rookie and he got, he got uh, the call unnecessary roughness on, uh, on, on the sack and I'm like, well, you know what? I, I, I get the referee why, why he called it. Man, I must have had 5,000 Raiders fans saying, you know, hey, you know, you're out of your mind. You're, you're, you words watch I your can't different say. game. I can't say the words that were calling me. And I got all these. That was the most action I ever had on Twitter. And I was like, come on, guys. I'm just watching the game. And I can see why the referee threw the flag. So they're very, very passionate. They know their football. And they care a lot about the Raiders. We were in the black hole. Um, I was with Ray Bachman. Uh, January 14th, 2001. I'm like, Mary Lou Henner, you know that. And we went out for the game and I was with Julio. We threw a little party. John Moga always loves to bring up. We went to Julio's. I had Julio on the show last week talking Raiders in the Bay Area. Raider fan. His team's left him twice, Dennis. He's our age. Lost the team once when he was a kid. It came back. Now he's lost it again. So, you know, I had to have him on the show. And he's a San Francisco guy, but was always a Raider guy, stable guy, he'll, right? He'll, he'll travel. It's close. Well, right to his point. He's like, you know, we lost him before. It's, it's a $98 plane ride. You get to go to Vegas twice a year. Right. We'll go down and okay. see him play the Chiefs or whatever. And and we didn't feel that way about the Colts. We certainly no. wouldn't feel that way about the Ravens if they moved them to Morgantown or something, yeah. right? Like, we wouldn't be into that. And there is a different vibe about it. And going out there and being a part of the first game, my wife wanted to go because she was adamant about collecting the new stadium. She's like, I haven't been. She hasn't been to Santa Clara. She missed that Super Bowl because of her cancer. Did you all like the stadium? I mean, aesthetically, it looks like like a, like a terrific stadium, especially from the outside. I would say this. My wife was up in the corner. Great seat. I was in the press box in the 20-yard line. I'm kind of shocked that Mark Davis made the press box so nice. The press box is open air. Mm -hmm. And for my purposes, and you'll laugh at this, I have a laptop, right? So I, I, I'll I, pull my laptop out so you can see what I'm talking about. So with laptops here, a lot of these press boxes are built high up. So when you lift your laptop to watch the game, you have to like look and peer kind of over the laptop and you can't see the field. Mm -hmm. This place had the laptop nice and low and there was a little glass nice. and the feet. So, so it was nice from the sight lines of the stadium, like from the bowl were beautiful. But then Atlanta's like that. Da Dallas is like that. But Dallas is so, so big. And that television is so big that it's unique. This oh. place to me, other than that goofy torch, yeah. honestly, Dan, if you plop down in Minnesota, it, there the uniqueness is the glass and the structure is more artistic. It's, it's beautiful. The Minnesota stadium's beautiful as a piece of art. Uh, and skull and the energy of it is real. This Vegas thing, they need to figure this out. Um, yeah. I, I would tell you the Atlanta stadium's almost identical. I mean, really, like, and that's more like black spaceship looking on the outside, too. I mean, they're all built, they're billion dollar facilities with artwork hanging in them. I took a picture of me with Evil Knievel. Um, so, yeah, I mean, go, go see the Stones, go to a football game. I mean, I, I think everyone should see these places. I'm not jaded by them, but I'm there for the game. You, you know what I mean? Like, literally, like, I, they could play Franklin Field. Like, you know, they could play over Morgan. Like, I, I like the game. And of all the stadia I've been in, the most impressive ones to me and we're, and we're wearing Charger powder blue and you're wearing the gold we are. today. Yes. That game we played two years ago out in Carson, I almost didn't go. Like, you know, it was Christmas. It was just sort of like, 
I'm really glad I went. It was a really unique thing. Yeah, to, capacity, to what, 27,000 fans or so? It's, it's cute. It was in a little yeah. college campus, reminded me of Dundalk Community College. Um, so, yeah, these stadia take on their own life. And, and a little side story, and I, I did put the video up. Um, I pull up, it's 108 degrees. And I'm dressed for three seasons because it's 108 outside. It might be 80 in the press box, but it might be 60. Like I've been in freezing conference rooms. So I have all of this gear in my bag and you had to get the clear app in order to get in. Right. Yep. Part of yep. it. Yep. And uh, I hear, Hey, Nestor, man. Hey, Nestor, man. And I turn around and there's Kim Herring. Kim wow. Herring works. He has a little badge on for clear. He is a vice president with clear has been for a number of years before he, when it was just an airport thing and you were just hearing about it. Uh, you're the guy I knew what the heck's clear. Clear is the app that they're using for vaccine sure. to show that you're you're vaccinated. We, you we had to have it uh, at the Eagles concert, right? It's at the Capitol uh, uh, Center. So, yeah. So that's now a thing. So Kim Herring and I was all worried. I downloaded the app in the morning. I was still playing with it at the hotel. My wife had done it three days before because that's the way she does things. She's an engineer and uh, I'm trying to figure it out. And I got up to the front and Kim just grabbed my phone. He's like, hey, man, here you are. You're all good. I said, <laughs> that's nice of you. Nice to meet a, a Raven at the Raiders gate in Vegas. And I happened to pick that gate and there was no one standing there. We were there like two o'clock. We were there really early. And uh, so there was a little serendipity. Remember serendipity? Yeah. I brought you watermelon. Serendipity's yes, continuing yes. everywhere I go. So uh, go. I run into Kim Herring. It was a beautiful thing. Yeah. Well, Penn State guy, smart guy. So no wonder he's doing great things with the, with the clear app. Well, you know what I would say to him? If you're that smart, why'd you go to Penn State? <laughs> ah, there you go. I went to Maryland. But uh, good stuff, and I think you made some great points about fans needing to be vaccinated to get into the uh, the Death Star, right, the Legion Stadium, and uh, that did change. Uh, they were they were the Ravens took the fans I thought out of the game when it, when they went up by 14 points. They didn't have much to cheer for, right? But you're right. The last eight minutes, the last eight minutes of the game, they uh, they they you can hear them on TV. You're like Fonzie with the light, I like that. That's the, great. The, my lights just went out. I got these motion lights, and uh... that means we, that means we, we got to go. Dennis Colazzo <laughs> will be here on Thursday, uh, hosting radio from three until five. And uh, this is a good time of year. We, you know, we have games every week. We have activity. There feels like this mountain we can't climb with Mahomes this Sunday, but that's what makes it fun. That's why we're going to watch the game, and that's why Al and Chris are going to come to town and to Baltimore. Uh, this weekend. So uh, that is just here. Find MD Colazzo show. And on Thursday and of course on Sunday mornings with rebroadcast and getting you ready for football. I am easy to find out of Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, all over the place, having the wise conversations that we have here. We are WNST AM 1570 Towson, Baltimore, and we never stop talking Baltimore positive. <laughs>